everyone. Welcome to Living in Victory. This is part three of the kingdom economy. And I've really enjoyed this uh, teaching and I trust that you have as well. If you haven't watched parts one and two, please do that. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time re uh, recapping anything. Uh, you can watch them in order. They're great, they build on each other. Praise the Lord. Uh, we're gonna get right into it. We're gonna go into Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. And we're talking about the kingdom economy. Now, uh, I'm just gonna read this scripture, Matthew chapter 11. Uh, Truly I tell you, among those born of a woman, there has not arisen one greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets in the, from the prophets and, law, and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. A couple things. Um, <laughs> the, the, the passage, uh, the violent, whoa, praise the Lord. The violent have been taking it by force. Okay, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence. And uh, the violent have been taking it by force. It, it, it's actually, this, this passage says raiding it, which, which is probably one of my least favorite translations of that, of that verse because I, I believe this, this is probably the ESV. I think the ESV is the only one that does that. Um, that doesn't make, that, it doesn't really entirely make sense. But when you actually look at what the, the words are talking about, um, it's talking about the, the, the forceful people, the people with violent resolve have been laying hold to the kingdom of heaven. The people with tenacious resolve, the forceful people have been laying hold to the kingdom of heaven. They've been grabbing it and they, have, they, they grab hold of it and they don't let go and they, they're taking the kingdom by force. They're taking the kingdom by the force of their faith, I believe is what Jesus is talking about here. And you say, and he's talking about from the days of John the Baptist. When were the days of John the Baptist? Well, John the Baptist is still alive at this point in the in the in the in in life. He's these guys just came to check on from John. John just sent these guys over there, and he's saying, "Hey, from the days of John the Baptist." He's talking about from the time that John started releasing this message of repentance and and paving the way for me to come. The the faith of people, the resolve of people to lay hold to the kingdom and to and to take hold of that kingdom has been happening. You know, and, and you can look this up. I encourage you look it up. Look it up in your Strong's Concordance. Look look up what they're talking about. Um, but it, it is he's talking about the violent resolve, the tenacious faith, the I'm not letting go, the when I touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. Faith. Not the, oh Lord, if it be your will. Not that kind of faith, that's not really faith. But the tenacious, the forceful faith, the I'm not letting go, I'm getting healed. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm grabbing hold of these precious promises of the word of God and I'm gonna see them come to pass. I see them in my mind, I see them in my spirit and I'm gonna see them in the natural realm too because I'm pulling them in by faith. I believe that's what Jesus is talking about there. Now. And, and then he also, he's also talking about the kingdom of heaven. And I know some people, you know, some people believe, well, no, that we're, we're in this age or we're in that age. The kingdom of heaven doesn't start till blah, 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 or whatever, whatever. Okay, Jesus came to bring in the kingdom. Super duper clear. This passage of scripture, again, super clear. From, he said, there has been no, from the time, from John, John is the, he's talking about John the Baptist, greatest born of a woman period, until the kingdom. That's what he's talking about. John the Baptist is the greatest born of a woman. Nobody else has been born. Who would that exclude? Well, if you look at this history, Adam was not born of a woman. Eve came out of Adam's side. Everybody after Adam and Eve, born of a woman. All the way up into Jesus. Jesus was born of a woman. Is Jesus saying John the Baptist is greater than me? Nope, that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, up until John the Baptist, before the kingdom of heaven came, John the Baptist is the greatest person, but now in the kingdom, 
And Jesus knew he came to bring the kingdom. Jesus is in the kingdom, all right? Jesus brought the kingdom with him. Jesus was born of a woman. We know that. That's part of our doctrine. We believe Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus, Mary gave birth to Jesus. She was a woman. Jesus was born of a woman. However, he's not in this, he's not, Jesus isn't saying John the Baptist was greater than me because Jesus lives in the kingdom. The, Jesus brought the kingdom of heaven. It, it, got, it came to earth in Christ Jesus. Now we're in, we have the opportunity to live in the kingdom with Jesus, through Jesus. And what Jesus is saying, prior to that, John the Baptist was the greatest. Now I have brought the kingdom and even the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. This is such a, this is so, there's so much going on in this, in this passage of scripture. There's so much, so much revelation that we can receive from this passage of scripture. We can look at the exploits of John the Baptist or Samson or Samuel or Elijah or David or whoever, Enoch, you know, walked with God and wasn't, whatever these guys did. And we can say, wow, they're amazing. And they are amazing, 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 amazing. Jesus is saying, if you're in the kingdom, if you got born again, you're even greater than they are. You, yo. What? what? <laughs> That's what he's saying. Why? Because he's in you. You carry the same spirit of Jesus. You carry the spirit of Jesus in you. The Father has made his abide in you. John chapter 14. The spirit of God, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You are the tabernacle. You are the tabernacle of God. Of course you carry, a, of course you, these Old Testament, John the Baptist, from the time of Adam and Eve, I believe that Adam and Eve were, had walked with God in, in perfect union until sin came, walked in sinless perfection until sin came. From that time on until Jesus came once again, walking in sinless perfection, John the Baptist was the greatest. But when Jesus came walking in that sinless perfection and bringing the kingdom of God with him, and now we get to enter in, like Colossians chapter 3 so, so eloquently describes, we get to enter in because we've died with Christ and now our life is hidden with him and we're seated at the right hand of the Father and we get to set our hearts on things above so Jesus can bring it into this, this natural realm. And we have unlimited potential in Christ. We live in this kingdom age. Any, any miracle, any blessing, anything that you saw Abraham do, any the blessing that was on Abraham, that's, that blessing is on you because that blessing is on Jesus. Jesus became a curse. He became the curse and he's entitled to every bit of blessing. He became a curse for you so that through him, you can receive the blessing, okay? He's in you, you are in him. Through Jesus in you, the blessing can flow through you like a river of living water. This is it, this is, the, this is what Jesus is doing right now. If, if, I'm telling you this part, back to this passage of scripture, if you have ears to hear, okay? And, and Jesus said that, John the Baptist was the Elijah to come. He, this is it. And this is Jesus, the living word, trying to bring us revelation of the word. <laughs> the author of the book, who is the book, telling us about the book. And he's saying, if you have ears to hear, if, you're gonna, if, you, if you can believe me, this is, what, this is the revelation you're going to receive from me. Because he says, uh, if you are willing, he is the Elijah to come. If you're not willing to receive it, it doesn't change the facts. It just means that you, you're just denying them, okay? If you're not willing to receive the revelation that Jesus is bringing of the Father and the blessing and the goodness of God, it doesn't change the fact all those things are true. It just means you're not gonna experience them this side of glory. It just means that you're, not, you're, you're limiting yourself to, what you, to the goodness of God you can experience right now. Jesus came to bring the fullness to us of the, the revelation of God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, God's truth. Man, and it's way better, way better than, than anything, than any doctrine that man can create. Any, anything that man can make up, Jesus is so much better, so much better. <laughs> I'm just telling you. So if you're willing to receive it, if you're willing to have ears to hear, you can receive the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not just a saving knowledge of him, but a, but a, but a 
healed, saved, delivered, prospered knowledge of him. Okay, and that's from, the, that's from the Greek word sozo, which Jesus talked about all the time. He talked about the wholeness of, of salvation. So now here we are. We're going back to John chapter 2. <clears throat> Jesus was talking about people with forceful faith have been taking the kingdom by force. Now, on the third day of a, of a, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee, Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus was with his disciples, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Praise the Lord. They get to go out and have, a, have some fun. Weddings are fun. I love weddings. They're fun. Uh, when, the, when the wine was gone, and I'm not saying I love weddings because there's wine at the wedding. So, well, you know, the, 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 it's part of the festivity, but I'm just saying weddings are fun. Jesus is there because he's celebrating. He's celebrating. He, he, he was obviously somebody you wanted to invite to a party. And, and when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, and I'm not just saying he wanted, you want to invite Jesus to a party because you know he's going to multiply the wine when it runs out. Uh, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Listen to Jesus' reply. Woman, and he's not saying woman. He's, he's, he's saying woman is a sign of respect. Mother, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Mm. This is awesome. He's saying, this is not my problem, mom. What's happening? Why are you talking to me about this? Like, uh, listen to his mother's response. She doesn't even, <laughs> it does not appear she acknowledges Jesus, but she does say to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Could it be that when Jesus was talking about forceful faith, he was talking about his mother? Perhaps he was. And Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding 20 to 30 gallons of water. Now we know it, we know it's going to happen next. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some water out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants had drawn the water new. Then he called the bridegroom and said, everyone brings up the choice wine first, then they bring up the cheap stuff after the guests have drank too much and can't tell the difference. But you saved the best for now. This is awesome. This guy is like, you know, the, he's the guy that's making sure everything's running. He's like the, the, the guy running the show. Now, Jesus, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why you can say Jesus performed this miracle. I think in this passage of scripture, one thing we can see is that he performed this miracle because his mother put a demand on the grace that was in him by faith. She had a resolve. She didn't say, oh, Jesus, if it be your will. She said, hey, these people ran out of wine. Jesus says, mother, it's not my time. And then she says, do whatever he says. Because she's, she's putting a demand. Her faith is drawing on the grace that was present in Christ Jesus. And the miracle happens. There's, there, I believe, you know, when we say the violent have been raiding heaven. The people with resolve to say, hey, this is, they, 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 we need a miracle here. The grace of God is there. And we saw it with the woman who touched the hem of the, his garment. If I can only touch the hem of the garment. We saw it with the woman whose daughter was afflicted when Jesus said, hey, I can't throw the, I can't throw the children's bread to the dogs. And she says, but even the dogs get the scraps from the table. Boom. This, that, that forceful faith that says, hey, I'm not letting go of this. I'm not letting go. And Jesus says, whoa. Woman, wow. Okay, I can't stop this from happening because she's putting a demand. The, the resolve, the forceful resolve that says, I'm not letting go of the precious promises of the word of God, put a demand on the grace that's there. And the, it's not like, a, like they're demanding grace to do something. They're just receiving the grace that's already present in the kingdom of heaven. So now, um, that's, <clears throat> that's, praise God. <laughs> that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about faith that can see the precious promises of Scripture before they're there, okay? Hebrews 11:6. 6, by faith is it impossible to please God because we must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. That's 
believing not only in God, but in the goodness of God and his desire to bless you. And then we see in Jesus, okay, I'm gonna, let's go to 2 Corinthians 8, 9. <clears throat> okay, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Actually, it was, well, well, 2 Corinthians, we'll start with verse 7. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love, we have, that we have kindled it in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test, I want to test, this is a funny passage, I want to test your sincerity, uh, the test of your sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Man, what is Paul thinking here? For you know, now this is it, this is verse nine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty, you might become rich. Wow, Jesus became poor so that for our sake, we can become rich. We can become blessed. Jesus, now this is part of the, the trade-off. This is part of Jesus taking the curse so that we can live in the blessing. Now, let's go to John 16, verse 33. Jesus told us something here. He said, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take courage because I have overcome the world. Again, we just read that Jesus became poor so that we could be rich. Jesus, over, Jesus became poor. He, he conquered poverty. It says this, it says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus overcame poverty. Wow. We might face economic challenges in our life, but take heart, Jesus has overcome them. It says, by his grace, again, this is great grace, we're talking about grace here, divine enablement, divine favor, divine favor, unmerited favor, divine enablement, by his grace, we get to partake in these precious promises of scripture. But if you don't know they're there, and if you're not willing to see them, oh man, I feel like Pastor Rogers just trying to preach some prosperity, blah, blah, blah. Guess what I am? Because you need, you need this. I am trying to preach a prosperity message to you because you need to prosper and be in good health. That's third John one, two. Beloved, I wish that, I wish, I, be, I wish, that you, that you could prosper in, in all ways and be in good health at all times as your soul prospers. I need, as a, as a, as, as a shepherd, you can call me a shepherd, you can call me a pastor, teacher, whatever you want to call me, I need to get this message across to you because I'm trying to feed you the word of God and I'm trying to get you to live independent of the earth curse system so you can fully depend and realize what God's called you to do and, and, and to, lit, to fulfill the dominion mandate on your life. It is impossible for you to fulfill the dominion mandate, to fulfill the call of God on your life when you're depending on the cursed earth system, the, the kingdom of darkness for your paycheck. It's impossible, you're not gonna do it. I'm not, again, I'm not telling you to quit your job, but I'm telling you to realize that your job is not your source. When you shift your thinking, shift your thinking, and you realize, whoa, God might use my job to bless me, but this is my assignment. And guess what? If it's not your assignment, because you might be working in a place that God doesn't want you to work. But when you realize like, wait a minute, I don't have, maybe, you mean maybe God doesn't want me to have to work 80 hours a week at this job that I hate? Maybe he has something better for me. Yes, he probably does. But if, you re, if, you, if, but if you're thinking that job is your source and you got to get up in the morning and drive into the kingdom of darkness and put in your 12 hour day so you can go back home at night and check back into the kingdom of, of Jesus, you're not going to prosper and be in good health. It's amazing what money trouble can do to you. It'll wreck your health. It'll wreck your marriage. It'll wreck your family. That's why God included it in the kingdom. When we come into this revelation that, oh, God wants us to prosper. 
<laughs> it's, it's, I'm telling you, your job, whatever your, whatever your job, your company, your business, whatever it is, that is not your source. God is your source. His word is going to instruct you and guide you. His spirit is going to, is going to bring revelation knowledge through his word that is going to cause you to prosper and be in good health in everything, every way. You are the precious promises of his word are meant to bring you into a full participation of the divine nature so that by them, every need you have for life and godliness is met so that you are free to pursue. And like the scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. So God wants you to put his kingdom first, not your paycheck first, not your boss first. You put him first, you put his kingdom first and you understand your place of righteousness in him, Matthew 6, and all these things are included in that. You're gonna be able to walk into a place of, of righteousness and, and, re, right, and understanding your right standing with God and live in the blessing. And you, you, you may be in the wrong place. You know, I say your job is not your, is not your source, it's your assignment. Your job may not be your source or your assignment. You may be at the wrong place. But when you come to realize like, wait a minute, this isn't my source, God's gonna be able to enlighten you and bring you into the right place. He's gonna lead you to the right place of employment or he's gonna lead you to the right place of business. You know, bring you into the right partnership, bring the right customers to you. But it first starts with acknowledging that this precious promise is for you, seeing the precious promise so that by that precious promise, you begin, you may participate in the divine nature. And if you, if you believe, yeah. okay, when I used to hear people talk about prosperity, I had a, a, a conditioned, I was conditioned, I was programmed beca because of the teaching I had received to think, oh, they're just trying to get me to sow into their ministry. They, they just want my money. Uh, have I asked for money from you one time? Think, let's think about that, okay? You answered that question. If, if my motive is to put money, your money in my pocket, one, I would be horrible. <laughs> that would be super duper bad and I would be doing the wrong thing. But two, I think I'd be tr tr trying to do that at some point. At some point I'd have to say, I'd have to put that out there for you. Tell me, have I done that? God wants to prosper you. He wants to bless you. He his word is going to prosper you. You sow into his word. You sow into his, mm, you sow that in there and you get a revelation of who, what his precious promises are. And when you start to see, like the first step in realizing that God wants to bless you, like, and this, this is about finance. This is, this is a kingdom economy message. And it, but this is true for all the precious promises of scripture. But until you see that those precious promises are truly for you, you can't see them. You're, you can't acknowledge them. But if you've got a teaching in your head that says, oh, now I've got to do this, or oh, now I've got to do that. Um, you know, now, 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 I gotta, now I can't listen to this message anymore. I can't, I can't trust Pastor Roger anymore because he's talking about prosperity. That's the devil trying to keep you out of your inheritance. I'm going to tell you that right now. And you've been influenced by carnal teaching that, that okay, one of the things, okay, here's a test. I, and I'm running out of time here. Um, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. You're not supposed to give out an obligation or reluctance. One of the reasons, if you look at the, a lot of uh, the ministers, a lot of churches that uh, teach a message on, um, oh, stay away from those prosperity preachers, stay away from you know, our, uh, the, the health and wealth preachers. Of course I'm a health and wealth preacher. Jesus was. Well, this is the gospel, okay? They try to get you to give because if I'm not believing for the blessing in my life or the blessing in my ministry, where do I go for, where do I go for resources? I go to the people and I got to put it back on the people and say, now you got to sow into this ministry. But if I'm not teaching on the blessing, I'm not going to say, well, sow a seed and God's going to meet your need. No, I can't say anything like that. But what I will say is you have to tithe to avoid the, uh, the curse. And if you rebuke the devourer, devourer with your tithe, and so I'm putting it, I'm putting it on to you to tithe and to give offerings, not, not because you're excited, and be, but I'm trying to get you to do it out of compulsion. I'm trying to get you to do it out of obligation. Scripture says really clearly that um, 
I'm not, that you're not, I think it's in 2 second, second Corinthians, uh, it says that we're not supposed to be giving out of reluctance or giving out of obligation, but we're supposed to be giving out of, uh, like, wow, I'm so excited. You know, Jesus, Jesus has blessed me so abundantly. I'm so, you know, I, I believe in giving, I believe in tithing, I, I tithe, I believe, in, I believe in giving offerings, I believe in the bless, I believe that, you know, I'm supposed to bless the Lord with my wealth and my first fruits and my barns are filled to overflowing and my vats overflow with new wine. That's the word of God. I, that's my, that's, that verse is for me and that's my reality. And it, I mean, it really is my reality. But I came into that through seeing it through the scripture. But if I'm gonna, but if I'm like, oh no, you can't, you can't believe that because, because why? Because God wants to keep you on the devil's system? He wants to keep, he, he wants your heart, but, he, but, he, but he's going to let your body stay over here. No, God wants all of you so, he, you're, so you can live in the place of blessing and be a blessing for others. So, man, I know we covered a lot of ground, but there's just so much to cover. In fact, I'm not even close to being done here. I just picked a place to stop. Uh, we're we're going to have to come back and we're going to have to teach on this some more uh, down in the future. But the bottom line is, you know, you're in a new economy, you're in the economy of the kingdom. And in this kingdom economy, you get to rest and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Not just, not just for your eternal soul, not just for your heavenly salvation, but for your daily needs. Just, just like Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter six. Your father knows you have need of these things. You don't need to worry about it. Seek ye first the kingdom. Don't try to serve two masters. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on him. If you're struggling with your finances right now, I want you to come. I, man, I, what I want you to do is I want you to look up uh, all the scriptures that we covered. I want you to go up, go into, um, I'm going to give you a second Corinthians chapter eight. Read through 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We don't have time to get into that right now. Um, Mark, Mark 10 verse 30 is a great one. Um, but 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter, um, let's say chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, um, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 talks about God being able to abundantly supply your seed in, in, in your bread. And, um, and there's just so much in that, that passage of scripture. Next time uh, I teach on the kingdom economy, I'm probably just going to jump right into there. But hey, I'm out of time. And remember this, God wants to bless you abundantly beyond all you can ask or think. If he didn't, his word wouldn't tell you. So keep living in the blessing. Keep meditating on the word of God. Let, this, let the Holy Spirit bring wisdom and revelation through the scriptures. Take every scripture that I, that I, that I read, that I took, look it up yourself. Meditate on it. Pray over it. Ask the Lord for clarity over it and continue to live in victory. In Jesus' name, you are blessed.